if you're asking questions to managers and coaches and and like I said before, sports scientists, physios, because they only improve you as a as a person, as a as a player, and and ultimately improve your career. Sam Vokes, thanks for joining me. Morning, mate. Nice to see you. I am. Um, I'm going to acknowledge straight away that that this is the second time that we've done this. Um, it is, mate. The first time we did it for everybody watching at home or listening, I pressed play when I thought I was, but I actually pressed stop. So we've had two conversations. Um, so I appreciate you doing this with, with I me. Know, again, mate. Mate. I was very happy with the first one as well. So uh, <laughs> let's hope this one goes as good. Uh, listen, mate. To get us started, uh, for the guys listening, everybody at home who, who knows Sam Vokes is a name. Um, but not might not know you as you know as as a footballer as well as I do. Um, can you just give an insight to to everybody as to to what sort of centre forward that you are? Yeah, I suppose um, in the traditional meaning of centre forward, probably a, a traditional kind of number nine. Um, I've had uh, I think I just finished my fifteenth season now in professional football, so it's been uh, been a good journey so far, and and hopefully a few more years to go. And uh, yeah, like I say, in terms of football wise, that kind of traditional centre forward that likes to get in the box and, and score goals. So that sort of centre forward that you're talking about um, as almost like a like a modern day um, centre forward uh, and 15 seasons now you've been playing. Um, in an era of, you know, being a certain type of striker at the top level is quite difficult, especially now where people are only playing one striker, really. Um, what do you think it is about you that's allowed you to be so successful over that period of time? Yeah, it's, it's quite hard to put a, a, a point on on exactly what makes you uh keep going but i think it's, it's that probably that drive to keep going um want to do well to succeed um there's also that that fitness side to it as well which you have to keep up and i enjoy doing i enjoy going to work every day um don't get me wrong in football there's there's harder times uh that you come across uh probably more mental than physical really but i think it's it's those times that drive you on and keep you going but that's the stuff i enjoy I enjoy the day-to-day -day work and Obviously, it culminates in match day and, and nothing beats that. Hopefully, we, you know, we're going to try and get into loads of detail really about your journey and, and your experiences. But from football, obviously, you just touched on there, 15 years is, is a long time to be a player. Um, from your first season to now, what are the, you know, the overriding differences between football and, and how has that really affected you and, and your role? I think a lot's changed. Um, I think probably more has changed off the pitch, to be totally honest with you. Um, look, we came, we came through together at the youth team at Bournemouth, mate, and talk about coming through at Bournemouth, even that was a, a completely different club then. Um, it was a club with no financial backing. I think the backroom staff was very minimal um, and you see kind of the growth that that club's come on and I suppose football in general has now. Um, then it was a club with, with not a lot of money, no backing and um, behind the scenes, it was probably just the manager, coach and, and a couple of physios. So in terms of that, I think that's where football for me has come on massively. You've got probably more staff than you have players now around the training ground and traveling with the team home and away. So um, the differences in that and, and what's at your disposal, I suppose, as a player now is, is massive. And so for people watching um, and, and, you know, trying to get an, in, an insight into your career, not only as, as a, you know, as a professional um, but in terms of your football lifestyle, you're talking there about having more access to sports scientists and coaches and um, probably nutritionists, things like that, as, as your career has, has gone on. How best, if people have access to those kind of people, how, how best can they use them? Like for, for you, Sam Vokes, as a footballer, like how best have you been able to use those people around you to make you better? I think it's important that um, you do use them. And, it, and it's easy to say that because they're there for you. But... It's, it's being proactive in doing that. Um, they're there because they're at the top of their field, I suppose. They've been at university and studying sports science and, and physio for to get to that point where they're working in professional football and they're working at the top of their, their level. So they're there for you. Um, and it's, it's, don't get me wrong, there's different levels. I'm at Stoke now and there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of physios, there's masseurs, there's, there's fitness people, but sports scientists. But I suppose at different levels, you don't quite have that... Um, exposure but i suppose um luckily at all levels now there's there's a lot of features online like yourselves and, and other people that 
offer that access to people online now that that is out there to get it and i suppose being busy and proactive in yourself and going to do that is is an important thing in um in your professionalism really and it's it's down to you because at the end of the day it's your career and it's you that uh, are going to benefit from doing that and, and being proactive and, and looking for those things so i have how have those guys helped you in your career you know the staff that you've got around you can you remember any sort of overriding memories of, of how you have used them and how you've benefited from that yeah i think i think it probably takes um probably takes a moment to go and uh do that i remember a specific one for me was i did my uh, cruciate ligament um in 2014 and, and for me that was my first real major injury um it's not that I didn't use physios or sports scientists before that, but it took me probably that moment to realize, well, there, there is another side of this that, that I need to add to my game. I need to add to me as a person um, and, and work closely with those sort of people because before that, to be totally honest, I was a younger player that, that didn't pick up too many injuries um, and didn't really... I didn't, didn't really do prehab before training. I didn't really do stuff in the evenings to benefit my body. Um, and then since that, I realized that those are the differences that, that will keep you on the pitch. Uh, my ACL at the time, I thought it was just an unlucky turn in the pitch, but looking into it more with physios and sports scientists after, there's, there's more issues around your body that, that will happen and it's a fatigue thing and, and you can avoid doing that. And unfortunately, it ended up me doing my ACL, but it took me that to realize there's, there's other parts of my body and my game that I need to improve and, and get better with. Did that injury, obviously, that would, you know, we're going to speak about it in a little bit, but did that injury change your perception of, of your football lifestyle? Ultimately, did, did you make a lot of changes off the back of that? Yeah, 100%. Um, like I said, I don't really spend much time in the gym before I went out training. When I was younger, 18 to 20, young, to early 20s, you could just go out and kick balls all over the pitch. You probably know what it's like, mate. And now I have to spend a good three quarters of an hour, an hour in the gym before I can get my body prepared to, to go out and do that training. But... I feel the benefits for that. I feel better about myself and hopefully a lot of injury prevention in doing that as well. So let's, you, you know, talk about football specifically. Um, in terms of the game, how has, how has the game changed since, you know, since you started to, to what it is now? It's changed a lot. Um, I think coming through for myself as a centre forward, I came through at a League One club in Bournemouth at the time and we played 4 4 2. That was the only formation you knew. That was what I grew up playing. Um, now, obviously, there's, there's a lot more different roles, and I suppose to myself as a striker, you have to learn to play different ways. It's, you see a lot of people playing with uh, either 4-3-3 four, three, four, three, three or uh, uh, central striker, five at the back. So for me, there's loads of different things, but I suppose coming through uh, years ago, I didn't really know those things. And as a youth team, we weren't really coached that because 4-4-2 four, four, was, was the only way out there, really. Um, I think in terms of formations, it's come on a lot, but I suppose the speed and uh, the fitness side of the game's come on uh, uh, massively, uh, miles ahead of what it was. And that can only be good and benefit, benefit the game, I suppose, with the coaches and, and sports science teams that have come in have, have brought the, the game to another level now. There's so much access that, you know, people can get to football now online. Young guys are playing FIFA now. So football intelligence... Um, for me, is coming on like these young kids now are, are obviously being exposed to different formations, different ways of playing. How much of a challenge was it for you when you started? Obviously, in a, in a four four two, we played that in the youth team. I don't think you'd probably be exposed to, to anything different. Um, to them, you know, moving on to an elite level and having to learn different roles. Like, how specifically did you learn? Like, what did you do? I think that's that's probably going back to what I touched on before and being proactive. And uh, I, I got my move quite early from Bournemouth from League One to the Championship and, and a strong Championship team in Wolves and um, was, was, was in strike, four of us strikers basically when we were there were competing for positions. Um, I was probably mainly back up as, a, as an 18 year old for, I remember Chris Iwilumo at the time, um, he'd had a great career and, and did very well for Wolves that season and he, he was my type of striker really. Um, I learned a lot from him there and and, and Dee was brilliant with me and, and I'd ask questions and probably be quite, quite interested in his career and how he come about it because um, for one, I was genuinely interested and two, wanted to learn as well. So I think it's important that, that you look up to these guys and, uh, and, uh, and take it in when you get that information. How important do you think it is, uh, is it for young guys now 
going into the game. And, you know, I say young guys, but I mean young people playing at the game at a professional level. To be open-minded enough to want to learn, to want to ask questions, to want to get better instead of feeling like they, they know everything. I think that's very important, mate. And it's, it's quite hard when you're young. Um, we talked about it before. I think when, when, when we were young, you coming through the youth team, the word busy, that was, it was a big word. And it was, it was a word used to be uh, kind of not, not suck up to the manager or anything like that, but you'd see someone asking questions and suddenly they'd be busy. The word busy was a thing. Um, but it was seen as a bad thing and, and jokes around the change room. But for me, it's, I suppose as I've got older, it's, it's probably the worst word that can be used and used in that way in the dressing room because why not be busy? Why not want to better yourself and, and further your career? Um, it's, it's something that uh, for me, it, it can only stand you in good stead if you're asking questions to managers and coaches and, and like I said before, sports scientists, physios, because it can only improve you as a, as a person, as a, as a player and, and ultimately improve your career. I mean, so let's touch on obviously those young days at Bournemouth. It's, it's pretty unique for, you know, a 17 year old these days to be involved in a first team environment. Um, and for us at the time, obviously I was, you know, we grew up in the same youth team. Um, for people at home watching, there was, you know, the first 10 games of your first uh, year as a youth team player, scored 10 goals and, and then moved on into the first team. Um, I wonder if you just can, can give everybody an insight into how that happened really and, and you know how you felt during that period of time as a as a young guy yeah it was it was it was an amazing time it all happened so quickly i think leaving school in the summer and um i think it was by the december i'd made my first team debut so it was it was a good start to my youth team um career and then suddenly don't get me wrong there's there's an element of luck in there i remember one tuesday night the um well one tuesday morning the youth team manager joe roach called me up and said that there's been four injuries or illnesses in the first team and uh, the manager at the time, Kevin Bond, wants you to, to meet up with the squad that night and uh, suddenly panic stations start kicking in and you think, um, I've never really trained with them before, probably don't even know half the lads' names to be honest with you, although you should do um, when they're the first team. Uh, and Also, I, I never had a suit, so I had to go out and buy a suit that morning. Um, they're back at it now, mate, and it's, I think it's still baggy now on me. Um, <laughs> No, they're the th sort of things that happen, and, and suddenly I was I was meeting up with the the first time that Tuesday, first team that Tuesday evening, and um, walking in the dressing room, shaking all the lads' hands. I turned around, and my my name was on the starting team sheet on the on the board. Um, and we've got Knotts Forest at home in front of a packed packed stadium. I think twelve thousand there that night. So for me, I've gone from <laughs> on the Saturday playing youth team football to suddenly starting with these lads that I don't even know and. And uh, yeah, it went well. I remember playing about 70 minutes and uh, we won 2-0 and, and that was where it all started really. And it was, it was a great night and um, a great experience. How important, hindsight for obviously us is, is, is a wonderful thing. And there was probably no way of knowing the Monday before that Tuesday that the next day you were going to be playing in a first team game, uh, you know, Nottingham Forest at home, which was a big deal at the time. How important is it for guys now to understand that they're never too far away from actually being involved, from actually having an opportunity and how important is it to be ready at all times for that moment? I think, I think you're right there, mate. I think it's, it's important for, for lads to be ready. I think with hindsight now, um, don't get me wrong, I, I, I mentioned there that there is an element of luck and if those four strikers that I mentioned weren't injured in front of me, then I probably wouldn't have got that chance that night. Um, but I think as a player and as a person, you've got to put yourself in that position that when manager needs to make that phone call, the youth team manager or whoever it is, the reserve team manager makes that call, you're the one he picks the phone up to. Um, there were other options, I'm sure, um, but that day he called me up. So I think I put myself in the right position by doing my work and doing my job and everything right at the time and, and probably performing well that, that he was, I was the one he picked the phone up to. Can you remember how you felt, you know, the moment you were just about to walk into that changing room? Yeah, very nervous, very nervous. Um, and. Yeah, like I said, for me, that night was probably meeting most of the lads for the first time because although youth teams now are very much in training grounds and associated with first teams, for us, as you remember, we were based at the college down in Brockenhurst and the Bournemouth first team were, were half an hour away training over in Bournemouth in Poole. So for us, it, was, it wasn't like you knew these people day to day. It was, um, it was quite a distance group um, with a centre of excellence then. So... It was. It was probably was meeting those guys for the first time that night, and then suddenly you're starting, like I said, in in a big game against top of the league team um, in a relegation battle, and suddenly there's there's a whole different pressure to that. If you were about to walk into that room, and you now 
stood next to the front door of the changing room and had some advice to give to yourself back then. Looking back now, what would you say? God, it's a hard one, mate. Um, it's an easy word to band around and people spoke about it, but if before, and, and even I've said it to young lads now when they, they come in and step in and it's, it's literally go and enjoy it. Um, enjoy the experience and take it all in because it literally does fly by there. Um, I mentioned that I've had 15 years playing now, but that has flown by in, 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 a, in a flash. Um, and if I remember to that night, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it, it was, um, it would be to enjoy it and take it all in. <laughs> I accept that when those moments come across and you're that nervous, it's quite hard to enjoy it. Um, but looking back now, I think, I think I did enjoy it and it was, uh, it was a good night. So how did that, from that moment, obviously, you know, the game goes well, we as a youth team were, were there to, to watch you um, and you became, um, you know, sort of brand the word around, but like a bit of an iconic figure for us to look up to, like, this, you know, somebody from, from our age is now playing in the first team, you know, it was some, something really for us to aspire to, to relate to. Um, how did being involved in that, in a first team environment, and we talked about facilities and Bournemouth not really having in, uh, any, how, what did that do to your football lifestyle? Like, did, did it become serious for you at that point? I think it did. Um, it was probably a bit, um, uh, I probably wasn't used to it at the start. Um, Cause like I said, we were based at a college. So I was going to college every day, still seeing my friends from school that had gone to that college. Um, and then suddenly after that game, I was training with the first team every day. Um, luckily I just passed my driving test so I could drive myself there. So that, that helped, but um, it was it was a different lifestyle for me because I was then traveling um, traveling to Bournemouth, which was about forty minutes away every day, training with the first team and not being involved in that youth team environment that I always was. Um, I think for me personally, probably tried to stay quite grounded in the fact that I wanted to carry on my my college and my studies work, and half of it was to see you boys, to be honest with you, in the youth team. And uh, every Monday afternoon and Wednesday after I'd finished training, I'd, I'd come down and, and still do my college work to make sure I finished my, my B-Tech and, and came out with those qualifications that, that were part of the youth team set up there. Um, and that was important for me to stay, stay close to the youth team at the time and my mates that we grew up playing with. A lot of guys, hopefully, obviously watching and listening to this will be in youth environments and, and there'll be a lot of guys in first team environments listening to this, but what were the overriding differences uh, you know, to you from that youth team environment to a first team environment? Like what, what were the differences? I think suddenly the pressure, um, don't get me wrong, between at, at the time it was only under 18s set up, there was no 23s or anything. So there was an element of pressure to your youth team because you've got, you got to play for a career, you've got to earn, earn, earn a contract at the end of it. But suddenly the pressure isn't on yourself, it's as a team and as a club. I, I went straight into a League One relegation battle with, with Bournemouth and suddenly we've, we've got to stay up and there's, there's a whole different pressure to that and, and you're not playing in front of uh, families and, and, and friends on a Saturday morning. You're suddenly playing in front of five, ten thousand, fifteen thousand 15,000 fans on a Saturday afternoon when there's, there's a lot riding on the game. So I think those pressures slowly came in. Well, no, came in really quickly, to be honest. And, and suddenly you're going from, uh, from one level to the next and it was important to try and take that all in at the time and, and try and take it in your stride, I suppose. Was there any long lasting memories you have of, of players' advice or managers' advice or, or, you know, stuff like that when you were first exposed to a football, first team football environment? I can't really remember, to be honest with you. Um, I, think, I think there's always, there was a lot of senior lads at the time and they were, they were brilliant for me. Um, they were good to have around and it got me involved in little things off the field as well, really. I was, I was still only 17, 18 and I was, I was going on, on meals and, and nights out with guys that I wouldn't, wouldn't have done before really and they were probably involving me more in stuff like that because they knew that you're coming from a from a different setup and to get you involved with the lads and it was it was great to be around that and uh and 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 come through with those sort of guys really because there were a lot of senior pros that have been there for a long time and it was it was a good environment the so that first year that you were involved i think was you know the, the finished in league one quite comfortably um the next season as you touched on was was you know a bit of a relegation battle um I must add that there was a 10 point deduction at that point. So it might have even been 12. Um, so, you know, that obviously went against the club and quite a lot of us youth team guys were involved at, in that period of time. Did you feel, and I know you're talking about pressure now, like I'm, I'm going to spin that on you in terms of a striker uh, and positional pressure. Like as a striker for me is, you know, I'm a defender, but I still see being a striker as being the most difficult position on the pitch. Um, did you feel pressure as a striker to 
turn up and score goals and to be the guy that was, you know, were winning games. I think, talk about that time, and I think coming back that second season for me was probably when the pressure really started. I suppose that first season where I had six months was probably a little bit, I don't want to say getting used to it because you are chucked in at the deep end, but I was probably getting used to first team football. Then suddenly I came back the next pre-season, um, manager giving me the number nine shirt. There's a whole new pressure to that. Um, and then, like I say, the club wasn't in a great place at the time. I didn't really realise what was going on. I was still living at home with my parents. So during that season, you touched on there, the club went into administration, minus 12 points. So suddenly got to make up 12 points in a relegation battle. Um, and lads in the dressing room wages have been cut in half because it's the situation of administration. So suddenly there's a whole lot of different emotions going on where it wasn't used to me because I was living at my parents, but suddenly you see uh, grown men that have, have got mortgages to pay for it. There's a lifestyle element to it and families to look after. So it was a whole different pressure and, and needing to stay up in the league, I suppose, that time. Um, you touched on there that the youth team lads were coming through. And for me, that was... It was amazing, really, because they were, they were my group of lads. They were, they were the lads I've been playing with, so it was good to have them around it. And, um, and we, had a, we had a strong team at the time, and unfortunately, we did end up getting relegated. It was an uphill battle, I think, by a point or so, even though we had minus 12 deducted. But it was, for me, on a personal note, it was, it was a great season to be involved with the first team. And that pr pressure as a striker that I'm, that I'm trying to talk about, how best uh, did you know, how did you deal with that pressure of... You know, because I I refer sometimes to to a defender as a bit of a fun spoiler. Where you know our role is to is, you know is to is to stop positive things happening, and your role is is to obviously to create those to be almost a front creator, and that's difficult. So, how did you deal with the pressure of you know of playing that role? Um, I think I think the pressures do come on strikers. I think you're judged on goals. Um, as much as the game's changed, I think you do you're genuinely judged on goals, and I think around then it was. There was probably quite a lot of pressure on it. I remember Bournemouth bought a striker, Joker 4, and we, we had a good little partnership going that year and we, we scored a few goals together and it was, it was just enjoyable, to be honest with you. I think I ended up with a few goals that year in, in a team that got relegated and for myself, it was, it was quite an enjoyable season because it was my first real run in a first team. Um, and for me personally, it was, it was probably those sort of seasons where you're getting a good run in the team that you feel your best. Um, as a striker scoring goals and playing games is what you want to do and for me that was one of those seasons that I look back and although I was, I was very young it was, it was an enjoyable time How were you approaching games you know at that point this pressure that we're talking about like was there anything that you would do before a game mentality wise or, or think about to, to help you I think back then I kind of just um, it's hard to think about it was a long time ago but I think it was it was more just just concentrating on obviously the game in front of you but um, looking after yourself off the pitch, I suppose, in that age group, 17, 18, like I would say, a lot of friends are at college. Um, not talking about the youth team, but my general friends I grew up with uh, were doing a lot of things off the field, partying on Friday nights that you can't be part of, although you, you, you want to see your friends and be part of it. The, those things you, you've got to sacrifice. And for me, it was, there was a bigger goal, really, and that was, it was professional football. And, and, I still needed to make a name for myself. So that was, that was the drive really to kind of give those things up. But in terms of preparing yourself, it was, it was important that you eat the right foods, you eat, eat the right, drink the right drinks and, and preparing for games. It was, we didn't know a lot. We didn't probably know as much as we do now, but you do have that little bit of education. Um, and it was doing those right things at the right times. I think a lot of the guys that, you know, I've spoken to, obviously, speaking to a lot of elite footballers, you, yourself included, that say to deal with the pressure of obviously performing on a Saturday and a match day, if you prepare as best as you possibly can and leave no stone unturned, um, sort of cut no corners, the least you can do is give yourself the best possible opportunity to perform then on a match day. Yeah, no, I think you're bang on. Um... And there's nothing worse if you've not done the right things. And uh, I'm not talking about superstitions or anything here, but if you've not lived your life right and done the right things in the week and you know you're going into a big game at the weekend, having not done that, there's no worse feeling. Um, and that goes back to eating, drinking, but it also goes back to stuff you do in the gym here day to day, um, getting your body right and preparing right on a, on a Thursday, Friday for a game on a Saturday. And it seems to be more and more football being played these days. So whether you're playing one game a week or three or four games a week, there's, there's always things you can do right and prepare yourself in the right way. So 
you know, we touched on that season, obviously being enjoyable for you must have been because, you, you know, you moved on to, to championship side Wolves in, in that summer um, and went from, you know, a relegation Bournemouth team to a championship side in Wolves that were, um, that the ambition was obviously to become a Premier League team. It was, it was a complete contrast in um, clubs, really. Um, could you give us a little bit of an insight into at the age of, I think you were 18, possibly even 19 at the time, um, about, you know, what a, what a move like that feels like at the time and, and what that sort of did for, for you as a person? Yeah, it, was, it, it seems to all happen really quickly, I suppose, since I made my first debut within 18 months. I think, like you touched on, the club had gone into administration at Bournemouth and, and they kind of told me before the season had finished that um, I was on the move. Um, I was going to be moving and I remember being pulled in by my parents and he said, there's a list of clubs, take your pick, basically, because you're off in the summer. So that was, that was quite a big decision to make and, and Wolves was, was the first one we spoke to and saw and Mick McCarthy and he... Um, he made me feel a million dollars, went to a massive training ground. Suddenly there's this huge complex where I'd never been to anywhere like that before. And he turned around to me and said, look, you're going to be one of four strikers in the, in the championship next year for me. Um, it's obviously down to you to earn your position, but you're going to be one of four and we're going to make a push for the Premier League. And, and that's what the club want to achieve. It's a massive club that suddenly, um, no disrespect to Bournemouth, but you're going from League One relegation battle in front of five, six, seven thousand every week um, to suddenly pushing for the Premier League in front of 25, 30,000 every week. And um, there was a whole new pressure to that. And, um, and, and I loved it, to be totally honest with you. It was, it was an amazing time and good to be part of. And that season, that season for me, I made, I think, quite a few appearances. I, I can't remember how many, but I think it was, um, it was great to then be playing a whole new level of football in the Championship. And... Uh, ended up getting promoted that year with Wolves. So it was brilliant. I want to ask you a little bit more about, so as a young guy, no real, um, I would say no real commitments. I know obviously you were with, with your missus at the time, but no real family commitments and, and stuff like that. You get given a list of, of clubs that want to take you. What sort of things are going through your mind? Like what sort of decisions are you, are you making and what's the thought process? Yeah, it was a tough bit. I remember, um, like I said, with my missus, my now wife at the time, and, and we... And my parents sat down and went through them. And like I said, Wolves was the first one we visited. We all went up as a family and they made us feel brilliant. Took us for a tour around the stadium and, and training centre. And then you're like, wow, yeah, I want to move to this club. And then suddenly it's, well, yeah, you are moving out your parents' so And then you're moving into to Wolverhampton, which is, seemed like a billion miles away at the time. Um, got myself a, a flat or apartment up there. And suddenly you're living by yourself and feeding for yourself. So... Um, yeah, my girlfriend was, was, was at college still um, and I moved out there by myself. So, yeah, there was a whole new pressure to life, living by yourself and, and sorting that out and learning how to, to cook and clean and sort yourself out, mate. It was, a, it was a successful season, as you said. You know, you were promoted to the Premier League, made appearances, you, you, you know, you scored goals. What was it about that environment, um, you know, a different environment from being in a team that's trying to avoid relegation to being in a team that's trying to be promoted? What were the differences and, and you know, how did you benefit off the back of that? I think there were big differences, mate. And I look back now, I think um, the kind of team and squad that Mick McCarthy got together, he kind of got probably a lot of similar players to myself that have been successful in in, in the Championship and League One. Um, and it was probably their biggest opportunity at a club like Wolves to go and prove themselves. And, and he had a great squad and, and group together that all came together at the right time and had that drive to go and get promoted. Um, like I say, we ended up being champions that year in the Championship and getting promoted to the Premier League. And... For me personally, at 19, having this all happen so quickly, it was amazing, mate. I couldn't believe I was part of it, really. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience. But like you say, suddenly there's, there's that whole new pressure that comes alongside with it and um, being able to, to adapt to that, really. What sort of stuff did Big McCarthy do with you when, when you were there? How did he have an, you know, an impression on you? I think the big difference to me when I, when I went there and the feeling I got from from Mick McCarthy and the club at the time was, was the culture that he'd really built. Um, and that's not even talking football-wise. I suppose it's just getting the group together and, and as a group and, and how you work for each other and how you respect each other on the pitch and, and uh, have that belief, really, when you go out on a Saturday. Um, I think for myself, when I first went there, I think it was, it was massive for me. I remember coming off the bench in my first game um, away at Plymouth and, and scored a late equaliser for the team and me on that day it was it was amazing Do you know what I mean I just scored my first championship goal but it made me feel part of it and um 
as a striker, you touched on before, what are the pressures of a striker for me when you move to a new club or something like that is getting that first goal and getting off and running it is so important. And luckily I got that on my, uh, my Wolves debut and, and that kind of started it. What was your game like at, at the time then obviously at Wolves in, in that season? Like what, were your, what were your strengths? What, was, what were the things that you, you know, that you thought you were adding value to the team with? What, what was going on on a match day that you felt successful at? I think it was coming into a team like that. Um, touched on formations before. Mick McCarthy did always play with two strikers. So for me, that was, that was kind of where I felt at home because I'd always played that way. Um, but I say I was, I was kind of back up that year for, for Chris Ulumo and uh, we had Sylvan Ebanks Blake at the time and myself and, and Andy Keogh were kind of the four strikers. And I suppose my type was, was Chris Ulumo and, and um, I was kind of at the start coming off and on the bench for him. Um, making those appearances, chipping in with my goals here, there. Um, but for me, it was being that physical presence. And I suppose if you're not starting as many games, which I've been used to at Bournemouth, it was, it was being that impact and coming off the bench and scoring those goals. And that for me was, was an important thing when I first went to Wolves was, was to get those goals and have that impact when you come off the bench and, and kind of make a name for yourself at that level. We are going to discuss uh, the differences between being a substitute and, and, you know, and starting and stuff in, in a little bit, but you know, at that age and in that environment, uh, you know, something a lot of other younger players struggle with is, is, you know, is trying to establish themselves in the team. Um, over the next few years, you know, after you've been promoted into the Premier League, um, you end up on six different loans at, you, you know, pretty big clubs. And, and when I say pretty big clubs, I'll name them for you just so people can, can understand. Leeds, Bristol City, Sheffield United, Norwich, Burnley and Brighton are all, you know, massive, massive clubs, especially for a young guy to be going on loan to. Um, I've also heard you, you know, in interviews talk about that time as being quite tough um, for you. What was it about that, that time that was difficult and, and what sort of challenges were you faced with? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. It, it was a tough time probably, um, probably off the field, but when you're a young man and you can, I, wasn't, I had no commitments, I wasn't living with my wife at the time. She was at uni and she was doing her thing. So for me, it was quite easy to chuck your bag in, in the back of the car and and drive, basically lived out of a car, the back of my car for two years. Um, suitcases, you're in different hotels. Um, and for me, it was easy to do that, but it was a tough time. You're, you're living in hotels, literally. You're, you're training with the lads, which is fine. You're, you're in the training ground probably from nine to what, one, two. But then for the rest of the day, you've, you've not got friends or family near you and you are in a hotel in the middle of a different city, which you're not used to. Um, so they were, they were tough times in terms of that. Um, for me personally, I, I look back with hindsight now and think they were where I learned probably the best part of my football, really, I suppose. Um, it's probably where I learned the game, probably learned about myself. Uh, big clubs with whole different pressures, mate. They were, these were in League One at the time. I remember getting promoted um, and then the rest were championship clubs that were all going for promotion themselves. Big clubs, as you named. Um, and they were, they were all different experiences, working with different managers, different formations, different ways of playing, um, different grounds, different crowds. And just to touch on one of them, mate, one crazy season that I had, I remember um, cause they only did 90 day loans at the time. Um, I remember in January, I went to Sheffield United. They were in a relegation battle at the time, a massive club playing at Bramwell Lane was, was huge, loved it. And uh, in a relegation battle, um, went there and I remember there were 90 day loans, like I say, so in March, I remember being on an international camp of Wales and they, they rung me up and said, look, we can't extend it to the end of the season. It looks like we're going to get relegated. But I've just had a phone call from, from uh, Paul Lambert at Norwich and he wants to take you to the end of the season. And I looked at the table, mate, and I'm at Sheffield United and, and looking at Norwich at second in the league. I was thinking, all right, it's not, it's not a bad one to jump into. So like I said before, my, my suitcase was packed in the back of the car and I was down in Norwich. Suddenly I've gone from living in Sheffield for two months to down in Norwich and ended up being part of... Um, part of them being promoted. So that was, that was kind of the highs and lows of, of going alone and, and dealing with different pressures and different clubs and, and different managers. You talk about there, obviously, about moving from different clubs, different atmospheres, different pressures, relegation, going for promotion. How important is it, in your opinion, as a professional footballer, to be able to adapt and to be able to, you know, be comfortable being in different environments? It is important. Um, that we touched on right at the start of the podcast, mate. I think there's there's those facilities now and people there for you, which is which is amazing at, at a lot of levels. And I think it's only getting better um, at the lower levels you go down as well. So 
I think you've got a lot of people that are there to help you physically in the gym, um, coaching-wise on the pitch, but also off the field as well. I think that's hugely important. Um, I didn't really probably deal with it as much myself at the time, but there's, there's the, um, the mental side of the game where, like I say, there's a lot of downtime in football and footballers do find that it's important that you don't waste that. Um, but it's important that you deal with that in the right way because the mental side of, of, of life and the pressures of football are important. And when you're having that downtime, it's, it's important to reflect in, on things in the right way and deal with them in the right way because, because it is tough and, and it's tough dealing with those pressures, I suppose, at a young age as well. You speak about the, that time, obviously with hindsight, which is, which is nice, about how it was important for your football and, and how you developed as a player during that period of time. What were you developing? Like how did you develop? What, how did your game improve? Like what did you learn? I think it's, um, like I say, it's easy with hindsight. At the time, it was tough because I wasn't, I wasn't used to it and you're stepping into different environments, different teams, different ways of playing. Um, when I reflect on it, I could go into each team, I'm not going to, but I think you, you kind of, you, you look at the different ways they're playing with, you look at the different players you're playing with, you look at the, the journeys everyone's been on and you pick up a little bit of everything from, from everyone, mate, every manager, um, and you do learn. And I think that's how you grow as a person in life, mate, not just in football, in different jobs. I think you, you have to pick things up from people. Um, I don't know, listening to podcasts, watching different programs on TV, do you know what I mean? That's, that's how you learn and you grow and, 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 and make you a good person, I suppose. So I suppose it was picking up all little things from different people and, uh, and football-wise, I suppose, playing different formations, literally playing different ways of playing. I probably never played with a one up front, for example, as I did with when I went to uh, um, some of the clubs and it was learning that side of it. And alongside those loans, I was playing international football for Wales as well, which was, was, was a whole different um, experience really and, and way of playing football on, on the international stage as well, I suppose. People's perception of a loan sometimes can be seen as, for whatever reason, a negative thing. Um, young guys now, are, uh, you know, that are asked to be going out on loan or, uh, you know, have potential to go out on loan are seeing it as a, as a backward step maybe or, or, you know, a step down. What would your advice be to people, you know, who are in environments where they might not be getting a game or young players like yourself who were trying to establish yourself in the first team but might have been finding it difficult? What advice would you give to those guys about what a loan can do for you? I think it's so important, mate. Um, don't get me wrong, it's got to be right and suit you as a person, as a player. Um, but I think it's so important. I think um, whether I agree or disagree with, with the 23 system as it is now, but I think a lot of people can get kind of a false sense of... Uh, um, security, I suppose, and being in that for a long amount of time. Um, I touched on we were just an 18 system when I came through, so maybe that was a bit brutal if it's 18 years old, yes or no, but I think with a 23 system now, I think a lot of people can get caught up in that and not get as much exposure to the pressures and, and dealings with, with first-team football on a, on a match day and a day-to-day -day basis as, as they can. And I spoke to many young players coming through and, and would highly recommend a loan move that was right for you because nothing that beats playing um, first team football, whatever level it is. Um, for me, I didn't look at it as a negative when I did it. For me, it wasn't, you're not involved, you're going on loan by the manager. It was kind of me knocking on the manager's door saying, look, I don't want to be sat on the bench one week in the stand another week in the Premier League. I'd rather be going out and, and playing football um, where I can. So I was, I, was, I was asking the question if I can go out on loan because it was something for me that I wanted to do. and. Um, I'd seen it. I'd seen other people go out, and um, I'd probably been used to playing first team football with Bournemouth as well before that. So for me, it was important to, to keep that going and get that experience. Let's fast forward a little bit. So 2012, um, you know, you're sort of a young young 20s at this point. You've just signed for for Burnley permanently, um, playing back in the Championship. You make 46 appearances and the club finished sort of in a mid-table. But in that first season that you were there, I think, you know, it's, it's probably fair to say that um, for whatever reason, Charlie Austin and Danny Ings ended up having quite a nice relationship and, and, and they were seen arguably as, as the, the two players that were going to play. Um, when Charlie then moves to QPR the next season and you and Ingsy build a relationship, you play near on every game and the club get promoted to the Premier League. Um, you know, which is an incredible achievement. I want to really know and get like proper detail from you on the differences between, and we've touched on it al already. I said I was, we were going to get into it. 
the differences between being a substitute and playing that role and the differences between being a starter and playing that role? What are the overriding differences? Yeah, I think that it is a different, it is a different mindset. Um, I think you've always got to be, uh, you've got to be ready. I don't think you can take your foot off the gas and think, oh, I'm, I'm, off, I'm on the bench on Saturday, so I'm not going to train as hard on Thursday or Friday. Manager's already picked his team earlier in the week. You can see what we've all been in those situations where you know you're not in the team, but there's only one way you're going to get yourself in the team, and that's doing things in the right way um, on a daily basis. And and when you come on as a substitute, um, it's it's a tough mentality to get into. We all want to be starting games and playing regularly, but I think uh, it is a squad game, uh, squad game now, and it's getting more like that. I think you see that. The introduction of more subs this season, um, more people involved on a match day, and and it's important that you kind of go into it with the right mindset. It's it is a mindset where I touched on it before when I was at Wolves when I first joined that be that impact. Um, I've heard it talked about a lot whether or not substitutes the game changes, and and that's quite a good mentality and good way of looking at things really because you are that player that things aren't going right for the manager's team that he's picked. You're the one that's then relied on to go and do that job for him and. And why not, when you step on that pitch, make that impression and, and get yourself in the in the running for the starting lineup the following week. So football's fickle and it changes really quickly. And look, if you go and impress in those 15, 20 minutes you get and the rest of the week in training, you can be in the manager's mindset the next week. So I think it's an important, it's a tough mindset because you are dealing with failure. Most managers name their team on a Friday afternoon, Friday morning um, in training and they work on the team. And don't get me wrong, there's always that disappointment in there. There's always that element of... Uh, oh, I should be playing, why is he playing in front of me? But you've got to kind of get rid of that and be part of a squad because football, especially these days, is a, is a squad game and, and you need to have that mentality. I know that's easy, obviously, to, to say and that's the ideal uh, attitude to have in that position. But is that something that you, uh, you, know, that you did um, quite regularly if for whatever reason you weren't in the team? Like, What did you do in the build-ups and match days and, and preparing on, on a match day? What, what was your mindset? I think you have to though, mate. And I think I'd like to think that I did do that. Um, don't get me wrong. There's probably days where, where you are down and you find it tough to, um, tough to deal with and, and you make the excuses and you look for excuses. But I think as I've got a bit older, you've, you've got to not look to those. Um, there's no point in doing that because you're just going to get yourself in a whirlwind and in a bad headspace that you're not going to end up performing. Even if you get asked by the manager to come on for 15, 20 minutes on a Saturday and uh, you've got to go into it. Preparing is you're starting. You've got to be preparing for that. Even if you're on the bench, I think you, you, the way you eat, the way you fuel, the way you prepare on a Friday night, it's got to be exactly the same. Um, and at the end of the day, you're on the bench. Just a player in your position might come off in the first minute and you're playing the next 90 minutes. So you have to prepare yourself in the right way or you're not giving yourself the best chance to, uh, to perform, really, and, and do your best for the team. Um, Suppose, like you touched on there, when I first joined Burnley, it was like that, and I found probably myself in the last year or so at Stoke in a, in a similar sort of position, and I've probably got a different mindset now because I'm a bit older and can deal with it. I'd like to think a bit better. There's still frustrations there, but you um, you have to still get yourself in the, um, the right mindset, and, and I think it's important now as I've got older is not have that excuses mentality because there's just no point, to be totally honest with you. You're just going to drive yourself mad. Do you see, let's touch on that a little bit more, because I think that's really unique, that, that excuses mentality. How often do you see that in football? Um, too much, to be totally honest with you. And you, you do see it a lot, and there's always someone to blame, and there's always an agent ringing you up saying, oh, no, it's not you, it's this, or whatever, trying to pamp you up. But for me, it was probably something I took away from Sean Dyche as a manager. He, he used that, that saying of a, a new, no excuses mentality, and I think it, it's so true because... In whatever, in whatever um, way of life, mate, it's easy to, to blame something else and not take it on your own shoulders. But at the end of the day, where's that going to get you? Um, I think if, if you go into it with, if you go into a match day, for example, with, with no excuses, not crying on someone's shoulder because you think you should be starting or, or something else, you can only, you're only going to bring other people down. And that sapping mentality as well of bringing other people down in, in the group is, is no good. So... Why not go into it with uh, with, a, with a good mindset and a positive mindset that you're going to have an impact in, and change the game when when you get your chance? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so let's flip it though. So 
the next season, you and Danny Ings obviously create and you know a pretty incredible relationship and and are, are winning a lot of games. You get promoted to the Premier League in that season. What are you going through now? As a, you know, as a main player, um, you almost probably know that you're going to play in the team most weeks. Like, how? What's the mindset there? How? What's the? What is your football lifestyle like at that point? Um, it's a weird one because when you're in that moment and you're flying and, and myself and Easy had a great relationship at that time and and we scored a lot of goals and won a lot of games. We were in a Burnley team that were dogs for relegation, I suppose, at the start of the year. Um, and we end up being second in the league to Leicester and, and end up getting promoted that year. And it was, it, you're just on a high, really. I suppose you're just, you're just um, running, on, running on emotions for that, for that whole time. And in a weird way, when you're not in the team, you're thinking everything. But when, when you're in the team and things are going well, it just happens so naturally, mate. I wish you could bottle up that emotion. You know what it's like when things are going well for you. If you could just, if you could bottle that up, mate, it'd be priceless. But I think, um, I think it is, it is all about keeping yourself right um, day in, day out. I think when, I think the way I've tried to live my career, I suppose, is, is not get too high with the highs and not too low with the lows because there are a lot. And if you kind of stay on that middle ground and a bit grounded, it's, it's an important place to be because um, it does go quite, it does go high and low. And I suppose that season for me was summed that one up really because it was probably my best year in football, scoring goals and uh, playing games. And, we have four games before the end of the season. I ended up doing that ACL injury at home to Leicester in uh, in a top of the table clash. So that was um, yeah, went from the highest highs to the lowest lows within a split second, I suppose. How unique is that attitude of you know don't don't get too high, don't get too low? I know it's spoken about quite a lot, but how difficult is it actually to to preach that? It's hard to do, and I suppose it's even harder now in a modern world where you've got social media and you've got um, a lot of. Um, outside influences, I suppose, and a lot of outside people talking and to friends getting involved and, and family. And it's, I suppose, when it's high, don't get me wrong, it's brilliant, but where, where is everyone when it's not so good? Do you know what I mean? And, and you like to think those people stick by you, but it's, it's sometimes not that way. And I, th I suppose in keeping yourself grounded and on that middle, middle ground and, and keeping the right people around you, um, which is also very important, I think, um, having the right um, group of friends, uh, people you speak to, agents, all that sort of outside influence around you that keep you on that middle ground is, is so important. So, you know, to round this up a little bit, uh, Voxy there, what advice would you give to, to people who may find themselves out of the team as a substitute, out of out the squad, whatever it is, who know they're capable of obviously playing and, and playing to a high level, what advice would you give to them as, as to how to deal with that? It's hard, mate, because I suppose when you're in that, you can't, you can't see the next step or the next level. But it, I'll probably go back to when I first made my debut for Bournemouth when I was that young lad. And I suppose it was keep doing the right things right day in, day out. And the opportunity comes about, then it, you're there to take it and people can see you doing it. Don't, don't flip. It's, it's not a switch. You can't flip it on and off um, just like that on a match day. So if you're doing things right every day, and keeping yourself in the right way. Um, don't get me wrong, there's that element of luck that has to come, but being in the right space at the right time, it, it will fall your way more, more times than it won't if you're doing things right. I know you've touched on it there at the end of that season. Obviously, you end up with an ACL injury that, that keeps you out for, for a period of time. Um, how difficult was it being so important to that team at the time, obviously, that when I can remember watching you be promoted on the telly, um, the guys are celebrating on the pitch and out you come on the crutches with the, with the knee brace on. Um, how difficult was that period of time where, you know, you're involved, you're, you're an incredibly big part of what's happened, but you can't possibly enjoy it as much as what other people are doing? It's so true, mate. I think it is, you, you did feel a big part of it. You felt a big part of the club and, and what we'd achieved. But on that day when you get promoted, you're not part of it and you've not got the kit on and you're not... You're not part of the celebrations, although I tried, like you said, I was hobbling around the pitch on my crutches a couple of weeks after surgery, which probably wasn't the ideal thing to do. But it was, uh, you do feel part of it, but you don't. You want, you want to have the kit on. You want to be scoring the goal on that day that you get promoted and that sort of stuff. But it was, um, it was, it was a massive season for me and it was a massive learning curve, like I touched on at the start of this podcast um, with this ACL injury, mate. And it, I, I believe it, it made me... Over those nine months, I suppose, that I was out injured, maybe a, a better person and a, a, and a stronger player on and off the pitch. People, so something 
incredibly difficult happens to you, like an ACL injury, it takes you nine months to recover. And you're now talking about it as that you managed to learn and that you managed to, you know, to ultimately get yourself to another level off the back of that. Did you know that at the time or do you just think that looking back at it now? I don't think you do at the time. Um, you talk about at the time, I, I, I did something in myself and uh, I think, I don't know why I started it. I don't know who, someone might have mentioned it to me, but I started a diary um, and it was something that for me kept me on the right path, I suppose. And it was uh, literally day one. I remember I, I pulled out the attic literally a couple of weeks ago, mate, when I was going through a few things, it was funny to look back at. Um, I'd written down some goals and targets um, over this injury, literally from the first word of, of getting back walking. Um, so the last goal was to score my first Premier League goal and I must have thrown the, the, the diary away when I did my injury because I didn't score one for a while and I hadn't ticked that one off. So I managed to tick that off the other day, which was quite nice. But um, I think that was an important diary for me. Um, I look back on it and it got me through times where I suppose... Um, they were tough. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a diary as in I wrote down how I felt every day, but I kind of wrote down my, my sessions and, and what I had to do for that day and whether I had a day off or not. And you know what it's like, mate, when you're stuck in the gym uh, like this and, and dads are going out training. And I'll, I'll always remember we got promoted. We had um, luck of the fixtures. We had Chelsea and, and Jose and Mourinho and, and, and all those big boys were turning up on the first game of the season. And I felt like I'd been part of the club that had earned promotion and deserved to be there. But I was um, not part of it and I was very much still learning how to walk basically again because when you're out with, a, with an ACL injury, it's tough to get back to those stages and uh, I remember the, the boys going out last week of pre-season getting ready to play Chelsea at home on, on the Saturday and, and you're not part of that and it's, that's why you play football, that's why you do it, to play in these games and I wasn't part of it. So that was, that was a tough time but I go back to my diary and... Um, when you're in those tough times, you'd look and think, oh, I've not achieved much this week. It's been quite a slow week, but you might go back a week or two and see that I was only doing, I don't know, three sets of the three squats. But this week, I was, I'd actually got up to six reps or something. And, and there were the tiny little markers that would, would, would help me push on to the next level, although you felt like you weren't achieving a lot of the time because you are literally stuck in the gym doing your exercises um, day in, day out. And it's, it, it, it's a tough way of doing it, but that was my way of dealing with it, I suppose. Is that something you devised? To, and the reason why I say is that something you devised is because I did that with, with a couple of mine. Like I've obviously been lucky, you know, I've got metal work in both my legs, as you know. And during that period of time, I found keeping a diary, you know, helped me to almost focus on my own stuff instead of focus on how much I missed being involved with everyone else. Is that something you advise, you know, guys going through long-term injuries to do? Yeah, 100 percent. I've mentioned it to a few lads that have had some unfortunate injuries recently at, at Stoke and it's something that got me through like, it might not be for everyone but for me it helped me um look back and reflect on times which were, were were tough but you can see the improvement and you can see those things and even literally writing on paper your goals and aims and, and you're able to take them off at the time um were important when i first did my knee it was i was not weight bearing for six weeks and then suddenly the next goal was to to get back walking and you did that and then suddenly you're jogging and all these little milestones make make up that time which you're off the pitch and for me, from game to game, it was, I think it was nearly to the day, nine months before I, before I came back and um, played in the Premier League against Liverpool and Boxing Day, I did it. So you've gone from, from being promoted in a championship team where, you know, I know that you were performing an, at an elite level, you were really fit at the time, but the Premier League, as, as far as I can imagine, obviously not from having experienced it myself, the level of fitness again is, is much higher. Um, how did you actually get yourself, you know, not only fit, but fit to a level now that you were able to perform in the Premier League? Yeah, it's funny you say that because uh, hindsight is, is another thing on that, that injury. And for me, I'd done nine months. And, and I say nine months because I kind of use that as a milestone that I came back from the day I got injured to the day I, I walked back on a pitch and came on against Liverpool. Um, but for me, looking back, um, although I played quite a few games in the Premier League that year, I wasn't, I wasn't right. I wasn't myself. I wasn't fit. I wasn't... Um, knee wasn't right there were a lot of issues still and I think although it was nine months I'd probably say to the following pre-season I had that under my belt it was a good 18 months till I felt back to myself again and back to, to the player I probably was the previous season in the championship so it was a big chunk big chunk of my time that was was, was dedicated I suppose to getting my body right and, and getting my knee right.
So can you give us an insight into the sort of stuff that you were having to do to, you know, because I can imagine just if you, as you've said there, touched on in your diary, you know, different gym exercises, squats and, and mobility and that sort of stuff. But when you were able to get back on the pitch, what were you doing? Like, what did a normal sort of day look like uh, for, you know, a Sam Vokes trying to get back to a level to play in the Premier League? What did that look like? Yeah, well, like I say, you've got the structure around you and you, <clears throat> you have the physios and the support staff and the sports science. So, so they build sessions for you to get you up to a level where they think you can go and play. But for me, I say nine months, probably at six, seven, I was probably ready in myself to play a game. Um, they structured it really well. So I remember looking back now and it was frustrating because you feel like you're playing a game and you're ready to go and get used to the first team. But you're nowhere near that point yet because for me, I play reserve football. So it was literally ticking boxes, mate. I remember I had to tick off. 45 minutes, I had to tick off 60 minutes, another 60 minutes, 75, kind of as pre-season goes now, but you're building up to that 90 minutes. And it was probably a good five or six reserve games before I got to that um, 90 minute mark where I probably declared myself fit at that point um, and ready to back training with the first team. You'd, you'd, you'd dripped in and out of first team training um, to manage yourself and manage your knee and, and your body. But um, it probably took me up to that 90 minute mark to, to say, yeah, right, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be involved now with the first team. When you say 18 months before you, you, you know, you felt you got back to the place where you were at the year before in the championship, where you've talked about, you know, playing your best stuff. Were you aware from say the nine month period where you come on at Liverpool to that 18 month period, were you aware or did you feel like you weren't yourself or did you just, you know, I felt normal. But then after 18 months, you look back on that period of time and felt, actually, no, I wasn't really. I think there's, yeah, I think it's funny because in the moment, I think you do feel like you're right. Um, I, I can only probably say this with hindsight. Um, don't get me wrong, in that time, I remember starting massive games, mate. I remember playing in big games against big opposition and, and superstars of the Premier League in that time. Um, but I felt like I was ready and right, but I probably wasn't. Um, and I say that because I suppose fitness levels weren't right. Um, and I probably did need a good preseason under my belt. We talk about the pressures beforehand and I probably came back fit into a team that was, was fighting for relegation in, in the Premier League at the time. So you're desperate to get back involved, desperate to be there. There's nine months worth of frustration behind me of wanting to play and, and get back into the fold. Um, so all those emotions were, were probably telling myself I'm right and ready to go. Um, not going to knock on the manager's door and say no I'm, i don't think i should be playing tomorrow <laughs> do you know what i mean so it's 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 those sort of things that you don't look back until probably that summer reflected and and had a good pre-season under my belt and we did get relegated in the end and and we ended up having another great championship that year and and for myself it was it was an important season for me to get back playing regular football uh, you've just mentioned it there and i want to get into this a little bit more about the pressures of you know of your position and um and wanting to get back fit and contribute to positive results for the team but so playing as a striker um but people who don't know and play different positions can you tell us a little bit about the responsibilities and pressure that you're under in that position i think it's i think it's changed probably as the game's gone on a bit more now um the game's evolved into different ways of playing different structures don't get me wrong when when you're talking about strikers you're always going to be judged on your goals um and your assists and, and how you um and, and how you're going forward, really, and how the team are playing. Um, I think more and more these days, I think seeing teams play with, a, with one central striker, and I thought it, it, there's even a lot of teams that play with a false nine now. So the, um, the striker's role has changed and adapted over the years that, that, that it's, there's a defensive mindset to it where you have to be really aware and you have to do your job for the team. Um, there's a lot of strikers out there that, that do that job fantastic and, and can contribute to a team, and I think it's how different managers play in, in different formations. But I suppose at the end of the day, you are judged on your goals and your, your goal scoring um, goal scoring positions and, and what you bring to the team in terms of that. I mean, your career speaks for itself, mate, in terms of the success. You, you know, you've always been somebody that, that as youth team guys playing with you that we've looked up to. But I know you've had periods of, you know, scoring loads of goals as we touched on in that Burnley season, for example, and, and periods where you might not have, have been scoring that many goals. What's the difference between the two? Um, mentally and with your appro approach to a match day and do they differ yeah they do um i touched on it there when i was, was scoring a lot of goals with bernie in those championship seasons that things kind of just hit you mate they just go in off you and, and that luck comes 
that luck comes with it. And don't get me wrong, you've got to be in the right place at the right time. But those things just seem to happen when, you, when you're in that form. And like I said before, if you could bottle that moment up, mate, it would be priceless because that feeling is, it is amazing. And it feels like every time you step on the pitch, you're going to score a goal. But like I say, I have and other strikers would have experienced the flip side of that where everything you try, you're almost trying too hard. Um, and nothing seems to go your way. Nothing seems to drop to you in the box. And everyone around you seems to be getting these chances and scoring goals. And it just doesn't fall to you. But they are the, the ups and downs of football and ups and downs definitely as a striker. So how can guys play? And obviously as a striker listening to this, um, going through maybe a period of time without scoring and, and feeling that pressure, what can they do to deal with that? I think it's important not to get frustrated. And, and that's an easy, easy thing to say because I've been very frustrated in my career at times. Um, touched on it before about doing the work day in, day out. And as a striker, when you, when you break it down to being on the pitch, um, being position-specific work is important. Um, when you're finishing work and your, your uh, positional work is important. But if you're, if you're doing that when you're scoring goals as well and you're happy, it's important that you keep doing that when you're not as well. Um, I'm going to say not to, uh, not to change the, um, the mentality when things aren't working. Don't suddenly just think, oh, I need to go and do 100 more shots. <laughs> Like be out there for stupid amounts of time because things aren't going your way. If you do the same things when things are going your way and they're not going your way, then it, it, ultimately it will turn around and, and go in your favour. Right, so let's get into, you know, you've mentioned it a couple of times about your international career and stuff, but I wanted to, you know, to give it its own period of, uh, in this podcast because, it, you know, it deserves a lot of credit. Um, you know, like me, I mean, you're much more successful than I was, but, you know, you represented Wales um, off the back of, you know, being related to someone who, who, who was from Wales. It's often spoken about, you know, when home nations accept someone who's English born into their national team, um, that it's, you know, that how can they really relate to, to playing for that country? But it's something that I think obviously in your career that you've, that you've done incredibly well. Um, when Brian Flynn called you up to the under 21s in, in 2007, what was really, how did you, you know, how did you approach that and, and how did you, you know, how did you buy into to Wales as a nation? It was amazing, mate. I couldn't believe it. Um, <clears throat> going back to when I first started playing at Bournemouth and it all happened so quickly. Um, for him to approach me, obviously, I was aware my granddad was Welsh and my side of the family were from North Wales. And it was, it was something I'd never really looked into myself. And, and a lot of credit goes into Brian Flynn for that. Like you say, he came to a lot of us and a lot of lads that are still playing now and going to the Euros this summer that were, were brought in from, from outside youth teams from outside of Wales, really. It was something that hadn't really been done in the past. Most youth setups have been, uh, come out of Swansea and Cardiff and Wrexham. And now suddenly Brian Flynn was, was going away from that and looking for people like myself and yourself that had, had grandparents or families from Wales and... For me, when, when he first had that conversation, it was, it was amazing. It opened my eyes, really, to something I'd never thought about. Um, and there was no other, no other answer than yes and, and couldn't wait to get there. And 17 years old, going to play for an under-21 set up in international football, suddenly travelling to all these places around the world playing football was, was amazing. What was international football like um, compared to club football? What, what are the differences? I think at under-21 level, it was... Um, it was it was, it was quite similar, but don't get me wrong, it's different because you're all coming from your own individual teams and ways of playing. And we were still part of a, a young group that were learning, um, hungry to go and play, really. Um, there was, I suppose, an unsuccessful first team in Wales at the time um, under John Toshak. And there was, a, there was a route there that we could see. And, and, and Brian Flynn had, had, had probably emphasised that to us as a group and individuals, that there was that route there and that path you could see to, to breaking into the first team in international football with Wales. And John Toshak, I suppose, at the time was, was, was willing to give young players that chance as well. Was there anything from those experiences that with, you know, internationally, not just 21s, but obviously when you were exposed to the first team that you managed to take away? Was there any, you know, exposure to other players, exposure to other managers, information that you were given that managed to develop your game to, to take back to your club? I think there is. I think there's so many things you can take. And I think, like I said before, taking little bits from here and there, you kind of just learn and it's all part of the journey. But suddenly you're playing with Wales at under-21 level and, and first-team level against um, superstars of the game. Like I made my debut against Iceland in front of a, a couple of thousand away in Reykjavik and then 
a week later, I made my second game against Holland, who were going to a major tournament in front of 60,000 in, uh, in Rotterdam. And, and for me, that was like, wow, I'm playing against the superstars of the game. Do you know what I mean? At, at, at such a young age. And for me, those experiences that, that I'll always be thankful for Brian Flynn and, and Toshak giving me the chances at that level to, to experience and, and be part of an international squad that was, um, that was on the rise, really, as well. My perception of how, what, how you say, obviously, to take bits from different people, and it's something you've spoken about being a young guy at Wolves, taking things from, you know, from the strikers that you were sort of almost competing against but playing with. Um, and as growing up, you know, I'm going to speak from my own perspective, you know, David Beckham was a guy that I looked up to, but as soon as you get into a first-team football environment, you almost stop looking up to the superstars and start looking up to the people around you. And by when you say I'm taking bits from different people around me, is that what you mean? That, you, you know, that for a period of time, obviously, you probably idolise someone growing up, uh, as most young guys do. But then when you are exposed to other first-team players, then you start to take information from them, and that's how you develop. Yeah, I think, um, like I say, we've all got these superstars that we grew up watching and, and believing we could, we could be them. We have the names on the back of the shirts. Um, and there's always that aspiration to, to be those, to have those people, and it's important to have that. But I think when you do get to an elite level and a first-team level, you're playing alongside lads that have, have been on their own journey and, and got their own way of, of, of playing, and it's important to pick things up for, from them, and suddenly you're working with them day in, day out. So it's, it's a different kind of... Um, suppose look at a different way of looking up to a person in the fact that you're, you're playing with them and you're almost vying for their position as well so there's that element of, of competition in it as well and uh I suppose it, it's natural to to have that but i think it's important that you all learn and grow together because at the end of the day you, you're part of a team and, and it's important that you uh you all chip in with your your bit so what did you learn from from being around these you know the top elite welsh guys and um and who did you learn off the most it's funny, really, mate, because we we went into a, probably an unsuccessful Wales team at the time that were that were ranked in 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 the hundreds, mate. It was it was it was a part of of Welsh football which wasn't very successful, and uh, a, quite a big group of us at the time, eight, nine, ten lads, like I say, that are still playing now, and were there for a lot of our journey through, throughout my Wales career. Um, kind of broke into the team around the same sort of season or so, and it was it was quite a big transition. So. There were, there were different things going on in the dressing room. Obviously, I suppose the lads that were there before were thinking, these lads coming in and we were taking their places. So there's a bit of, a bit of competition in that as well and a bit of rivalry. But the, um, the group we had um, kind of stuck together for a long time and uh, it was great to be part of. And, and you kind of learn and pick things up along the way, but you'll go back to your own clubs. And I suppose that's, it's, it's also a, a key part of, of my career, really, because I had a good 10 or 12 years at international level with a similar group of lads. And, and you all play in different ways at your clubs, but you come together for that week and, and you play together and have to work out uh, how each other plays. Tell me a little bit more about that mindset that you go through where you're a young guy, um, you're, you know, you're having a successful moment with your club, but ultimately you're going into an environment where you're taking an older player's position. There's going to be a lot of young guys you know, listening to this or in youth team environments that ultimately have to take someone's place to get in the team. How do you best approach doing that and, and how can you best manage that situation? Obviously, because the person's position you're going to take is, is, isn't going to be happy about it. No, of course. And it's, it's a funny one way. So I suppose I've had it on the flip side now with Wales as well because I've come out of the fold there for, for a little bit. I hope to get back playing for Wales one day because it's, it's always been a great, uh, great thing for me playing for Wales. But I suppose there's now been a, a new uh, crop of lads over the last two or three years that Ryan Giggs has brought through and... Uh, I suppose broken into the team and and we were those guys 10 years ago do you know what I mean so it's it's important that when you're coming into that I suppose I didn't think about taking someone else's place I just wanted to break into the team and you don't think about the emotions that go along with it but um it's hard to say how you go about it really because you, you just go in and you train and, and you let the manager make his own decisions really but I suppose you can only train to 100% of your your capabilities and, and then hopefully the manager will pick you and, and that natural progression happens where you come in and, and take someone's space. Yeah. So for 10 years, not only were you part of a successful Welsh team, obviously we'll get into that a little bit more now, but you are, and you know, we've discussed this, and I'm going to say it on the podcast just so everybody knows, you've scored the most goals for Wales more than any other player born outside the country. That is, you know, an incredible achievement. What, um, how does that make you feel really? 
Yeah, it's great. It's great, mate. It's, it's, a, it's a mad stat, obviously, because you're not people will look at it as you're not born in that country or whatever. But for me, I totally embrace Wales and the culture and, and, and what it means to play for Wales. So for me, that's that's an important one, and it's it's a great feeling to have, have been part of a, a fantastic Welsh team and Welsh squad, and, and to have chipped in with my goals along the way, were, which were important at times. And uh, it's it, it's nice to have that behind me. Yeah. What do you think it was about international football during that period of time that allowed you to, to score so many goals? Why did you think you were so successful? Um, a lot of things, mate. We had, we had a great team coming through. We had, we had the superstars of, of Gareth Bale, Aaron Ramsey, and we, Joe Allen. And we, we also had a lot of, lot of lads that, that turned up every week and wanted to play for Wales, which probably hadn't happened in the past. Um, you hear stories about previous squads and previous players that... that might have thrown in injuries or not wanted to turn up because there were summer fixtures or whatever. And for us, I think as a group, we, we always wanted to be part of it and be part of something big for Wales. And, and luckily we managed to achieve that in, in the Euros in 2016 and being part of that and part of that with a, a good group of people as well, not just good footballers, a good group of people. It was, it was important that we had that. And uh, I think that's what got us so far. What were the detail then on that 2016 Euros? What was the detail in, in the squad at the time? Like, why do you think your, your Welsh team and during that tournament uh, was allowed to be so successful? I think um, going into that tournament for us, it was, it was a new thing. We, the country had not been to a competition for 58 odd years, I think it was. So for us going there, there was such a buzz around the country, buzz around the squad, buzz around the team that was almost no expectation of, of how far we're going to get. We're just going to turn up and we're going to enjoy it. Um, don't get me wrong, within camp and within the team, we were very professional in, in how we went about it and how we, we did our uh, pre-match um, analysis and, and all the work going into it. But ultimately for us, it was, it was a new experience and one we just wanted to embrace and, and, and enjoy. Uh, and that first, first couple of group games for us, it was, um, it was amazing really. And, and we ended up going on, on a great run to the semi-finals. What did that tournament do for you specifically as, as a player? What, what did you take from, from that period of time? It's funny really, mate, because I touched on the group stages and, and I was on the bench for the first game. Um, didn't come on against Slovakia. We played England in the second game. Um, we went 1-0 up, so um, I was also on the bench for that and we ended up losing in the last kick of the game and suddenly... I hadn't kicked the ball at the Euros and it was, um, we just lost to England and we were playing a, a massive nation in Russia next, which were a great team. And suddenly if we didn't win that, we were on the plane back home and, and, and it all happened so quickly and I hadn't kicked the ball yet. So for me, it was, it was a mad feeling really. And I remember the day before um, we played Russia in the final group game, um, Chris Coleman, the manager, called me and said, look, you're starting against Russia. That's when the nerves start kicking in and everything. But, um, I, was, I was so excited and wanted to be part of it. And for me, not just me personally, but as a team, I think that Russia game, we went on to beat them 3-0 in such a high-pressure game and probably the most enjoyable and best game I've seen a Wales team play in, in many years. And, and that, was, that was fantastic to be part of and almost um, a nice one to tick off that I got my appearance there as well. With such a high-pressured game, so let's, let's take, you know, you will have played him in your whole career. And guys playing this, you know, listening to this will, will be playing in games like that, maybe at not the same level, but games that they perceive as being high pressure. You know, if you don't win this game, um, it, you're going home. So, you know, there's, there's no, you know, there's no more pressure on a game than that. How do you approach that as, as a player? Do you try and approach it the same as any other game? Or, is, you know, there must be a difference. Yeah, there is a difference. And I think it probably was... Uh, emotion of the, of the team at the time. I think we knew that there was a lot riding on it and it was managed well by the manager. Um, we just lost to England in a high pressure game. It was built up as, as, as the great British tie uh, going into the group. It was the only one everyone was talking about. Suddenly we, we were going from being one nil up in that and leading the group to, we lost the game in the last kick of the game, two one, and we were going home. And I think the manager dealt with it really well. Um, we had a game four days later and we were meant to train the following day, but he said, no, like we got back to our base camp and gave us the day off and we all walked into town and we, were, we went and had ice creams and sat down and, and chilled out with each other and had a coffee and actually sat down and I suppose didn't think about football for a day, um, which was quite nice because there'd been so much pressure on everything beforehand that the manager actually just 
de-stressed everyone and it was it was quite a relaxed time and we went into that Russia game probably probably relaxed and, and a lot less pressure than we probably on the outside was perceived we had because I suppose everyone thought it was do or die game and probably a lot more chilled out than, than most people um, would, would have perceived us at that time. So on the Friday morning, obviously, well, maybe not the Friday morning, but the day before the game, you, you, you know, you're told you're starting in the team the next night. You obviously understand how much of a high pressure game that is. You're just about, obviously, to make your debut in, in the Euros, which is a, an incredibly big deal. How did you, how did you approach that, that, you know, that period from Friday, or I say Friday, but from the morning to, to the game day? What did you do? Yes, yeah, it's, it's funny, mate, because I think I was... Um... Myself had come off back of a good season. We got promoted with Burnley that year, and it, it was it was a great season. So I believed in myself totally. I think it was just the fact of of, of stepping into playing for for your country at that stage, which I'd never represented now. So the nervousness came from that, really. Um, I think the way we kind of set up them with Wales, it was either myself or or Hal Robson Carnu that was one of the strikers that played at the time, depending on the opposition. So we work on Russia, and they had two big centre halves at the time. So Plan was obviously I'd, I'd play them, stretch the centre half, and kind of let Bell and Ramsey in behind me have that kind of free role, I suppose, in the number ten, and, and it worked a treat because they both scored that day, and we, we ended up winning three 0 So I think a lot of work that went on off the field and, and preparation set us up to to play in the, the perfect game that night, really. So now that your career career is is you know we're both thirty one now, so it's you know, we've not got much longer left. I'm sure, well, I'm sure we do have uh, long left, but not, not too much longer, mate. But what is the difference between Sam Vokes, the 17-year-old, and Sam Vokes, the 31-year-old, that's, you know, made over 500 appearances? What are the main differences between the two, do you think? Um, well, I think I've still got a few games left in the legs, mate, anyway. But uh, it's, it is a big difference, I suppose. I suppose there's, we touched on the hindsight before, and you do pick up a lot and you learn a lot along the journey. Um, it's good to look back on things. I don't try and reflect too much until probably that day I stopped kicking the ball and, and, and you realise kind of what you achieved over your career and you look back, but I don't look back too much now because I think it's important to, to keep going forward and, and look forward to the next step really and the next challenge. And now I, I look forward to my next challenge. I don't know what that is or where that is. I think it's, um, it's, it's a part of our careers now where it's important to, to enjoy it and, and still have that challenge and, and those challenges going forward because... Um, sometimes you can look back and it's, it's easy to take the foot off the gas but for me I'm, I'm, I'm excited for, for the next few seasons coming up and, and want to get back playing and, and scoring goals really mate um, what would I say to a 17 year old self um, it's quite hard I, I touched on that easy throwaway word of enjoy it but just, just, I'd like to think I'd look back and, and I have enjoyed what I've done so far what I'm interested in to know, have you picked up habits in your career? Like, do you have a routine now? Is there things that you need to do to get the best out of yourself? Do you have those? Do you have any of those? Do you know what? It's funny, mate. I probably had a lot more when I was younger in superstitions and which boot I put on first or when I put my shirt on. Probably a lot more when I was younger and probably got rid of them all, mate, because I realised that they were no good for you because you suddenly step on the pitch and you think, oh, I, put, I tied this lace up first before this one. And then it starts going around in your head, mate. Do you know what I mean? So those little things or listening to a song before I went out, I didn't listen to that song and it's, that means I'm not going to score today or some, something like that. So for me, it's those little habits and superstitions, it's, you, do, you have them naturally. Um, but you try and phase them out, I suppose, and, and I don't really have any more, and, any more to be totally honest with you. So it's, um, I suppose the best habit is just to, to do things in the right way and, and prepare yourself in the right way. And I'll put you on the spot just to finish us off, mate, but 17-year-olds, I'm going to just use 17-year-old as, as you know, a young, a young guy trying to get into professional football now. What do you think the main attributes, I won't put a number on them, but what do you think the main attributes are that they need to, you know, to, to be doing to, to have a successful career in football? It's funny, mate, because you talk about in football attributes and, and probably most of the ones I'd say would not be, um, would not be technical. Um, don't get me wrong, you've got to be at a certain technical level to, to play uh, professional footballer, the main attributes would probably be um, the mentality and the drive and, and the will to, to want to succeed, really. Um, we all know the stats that come out of the amount of players that, that fall at the wayside and don't actually make it. And it's, it's those ones that you've got to put yourself in, in the right position to, to uh, get that opportunity. Um, touched on before, there's an element of luck, but you have to be the one that, that gets that phone call and, and um, 
in terms of attributes, I suppose it is is having that drive, that mentality, and that and that wants to do well and win. Appreciate it, mate. Folks, thank you very much for that. I enjoyed that conversation, mate, much more than the first. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Cheers, mate. No worries. Guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Sam Vokes as much as I did and have some lessons and takeaways to put into your game and try at training tomorrow. Remember to subscribe, like and review the show via your podcast channel and press the bell button so you never miss a release if you're watching us on YouTube. Head to the ePerform website for even more football-specific information and subscribe to our mailing list to get all the best actionable advice straight to your inbox for free. Andre Partington, see you soon.